Hey Peter, so welcome back to the second version because uh, it's fucking too hot in El Salvador <laughs> and the hardware doesn't make it. So, fence, hardware, AC. I'm Canadian, I don't even think it's that hot. So, I no. think it was just crummy cameras. Yeah, you're from Canada, true. Yeah. I lived uh, four years in Montreal. You're yeah. colder than Toronto. Uh, you're from Toronto? Yeah. It's a nice city. Peter, before we, we left, uh, I ask a question which is uh, very important for Bitcoiners, uh, especially maximalists. It's uh, which implementation of privacy are you using on the base layer? Uh, so Wasabi summarized the big debate. Join market uh, is a great solution too. We had Adam uh, just before. What's your point of view on that? We well, want some space. These days, I use Wasabi. I need to get around to looking at what Join market has been up to lately. But... Uh, Scammer eye is nonsense. This whole bit about uploading XPUB just undermines everything. It's, it's just so utterly bad that it would not be too surprising if it turned out that Scammer eye was some kind of uh, you know, government run operation to ensnare people. Which is exactly what the samurai people would tell you about on yeah. Wasabi. Yeah, you know, they can go say what they want, but. The very idea of you start a wallet and by default it uploads yeah. the XPUB from which all other keys can be derived to a centralized server who can just, from that XPUB, de-anonymize coin joins is nuts. Like, I'm sorry, they just don't have any excuse. If they want to go fix that, well maybe they can start, you know, arguing that maybe their thing isn't so bad. But until they fix that, I mean, they just, there's no reason to even look at what they're doing. So let's say... We do agree it's like a wet thing. Would they be able to run Samurai without taking the XPUB? Or is it like fundamental? Oh, yeah. It's, it's not hard to redesign the service. In fact, you know, one of the things they could do, of course, the most obvious thing they could do is use XPUB for only the inputs to coin joins. Mm -hmm. And for the outputs, go use, say, a separate XPUB. Or, you know, for each output, like, ask the coin join quarter, hey, you know, what coin join just finished? All right, my output's there. Ah, oh, great. So I do a transaction. Like, there's just so many ways around this. Um, Wasabi itself uses uh, Neutrino, which mm -hmm. is just a decentralized way of filtering Bitcoin blocks. It's a fairly obvious thing to do. And, you know, but Neutrino then, was invented for this purpose. I mean, well, I should say invented for like light, lightish wallets. It's just the obvious thing to do. But then if I want to be the developer kite and be on the Scamerai side, which uh, a lot of French people are, I would say that Wasabi is re reusing addresses. They fucked up uh, many times and we could have like traced well, the coins. Well, I mean, that's not uh, Wasabi uh, fucking up. That's Wasabi users fucking up. You know, Wasabi, they fundamentally are not in a position where they can go prevent people from installing the same seed on multiple wallets at once and using it in multiple wallets at once. It's not reasonable for them to go prevent that. Also, when you're talking about address reuse, for instance, if I'm a Samurai user mm -hmm. and I reuse an address that's an input to a coin join, well, I mean, that's just something you can expect to support. There is no way for a coin join implementation to reasonably prevent that. And there's also good use cases for it. I mean, maybe I want to have donations, right? Maybe I want to have a public donation address, but I want to then preserve the privacy of the coins that get sent to that donation address and where they go. Yeah. Right? That's an obvious thing I could go do. Similarly, on the other side of this, I mean, I could have a Wasabi wallet and I could use that wallet to make donations to a singular donation address. Again, that's coin joins being taken from the coin join and going to the same place. In both cases, you know, addresses are being reused. It doesn't matter how many steps you add before and after that process. The fact is addresses are being reused either before or after coin join for completely reasonable reasons. It's just not in their position to try to prevent that. There's no reason they should. Yeah, but also, maximalist samurai people will respond and said that Wasabi as an entity went a step forward and are working or have been working with, like, with, with some chain analysis companies. Um, well, I mean, past. working with chain analysis companies is a very silly way to put it. They are paying for chain analysis service so they can have a fig leaf of, oh, you know, we go filter out bad inputs. Which is censor. So? It's just them being cowards, that's all. All right. And I mean, I'm okay with being, people being cowards when they're doing something useful. Like, look, I'm not, in, I'm not in a position to say that they personally should be more brave. Yeah. Right? Because after all, 
I can do my own Wasabi coin join coordinator. Yeah, it's why, really why is hard. This, you yeah, need a lot why, of liquidity and get well, it started. Well, but it's not that hard. I mean, you don't need a lot of liquidity. Once you have some, people go get more and so on. Like, any amount of liquidity is enough to begin improving things, improving coin joins. Mm -hmm. So, like, if someone wants to go in, if someone's complaining about this, go start your own damn coordinator. It's not that hard. It's actually what uh, Wasabi has asked us uh, to provide at the university to create a course on how to set up our own yeah. implementation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, with the, some partnership yeah. with... Um, also, I mean, ignoring all this, all right, you don't like Wasabi, I don't know, huge join market. Yeah, we like join markets too. Yeah. I mean, it's for various reasons. It's because it's more decentralized than Wasabi. It'll mm -hmm. inevitably be harder to just install and use, which frankly is why I've been a bit lazy and got around to using it. I used to use it. Um, but I wanted to stop it. I never actually contributed code. Um, I might have contributed a bug report or something. Mm. But you know, I used to use it, and then for various reasons, just kind of got lazy. And uh, I, I got to get back into looking at how it works again. But you know, for the most part, I just use Wasabi. Of course, I don't trust Wasabi for everything. I mean, what I wind up name, namely doing is I take coins that mm -hmm. go through Wasabi and I open Lightning channels with them. All right. And I use Lightning to then provide a second layer of, of privacy. That's actually smart because one of the issues with Lightning privacy-wise, well, there's many, but one of them is like, where do, how do you open and close the channels and where does it go at that point? Uh, so you code join and you directly send them to it. Well, I mean, also a point I'd make is all privacy tech has potential being imperfect. Mm -hmm. Now, you might be, it might work perfectly, but it may not. It's always good to layer this stuff and have more than one thing protecting you. So why wouldn't you go and open a lightning channel with coin joint coins? You might as well. Yeah. But like it's an issue more on like whether it's was a B Samurai to like join market. It's like no, they have partnership with Trezor and BTCP server. But then again, at the end of the day, Trezor is an entity, it's regulated and it will need to comply with the rules. So look, the fact that Samurai feels they can go get away with, without the stuff is yet more reason to be suspicious of them. How did they you know, with join market, of course, join market's decentralized system. So that's, yeah, its own, that's its own argument. But summarize an entity with... Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's much more likely that something fishy is going on. And it's, you know, I'd give it like 50-50 chance that they're actually in reality working with coin join, or sorry, working with um, chain analysis companies to de-anonymize coin joins. It would not surprise me one bit. Because our architecture is just, it is unforgivably flawed. You just cannot make a technical argument to use their architecture. I'm sorry, you just can't. And all this bit about, oh, you know, you run dojos, that's just nonsense. But you could run dojo. Why is it nonsense? It is nonsense because many people will not. Yeah. Very large not numbers reason. of people that's not. not and reason. also, if you make the mistake once, yeah, yes, that is enough to de anonymize all future coin joins, even if you go turn on your own dojo. I'm sorry, there is no excuse for this design. It is absurdly busted. It is dangerous as hell. The dojo thing just looks like them trying to fig leaf over this. Oh, we can run a dojo. Of course, they know people won't. I'm sorry, there's just no excuse. And the only thing they can do to get back to the good graces of Bitcoin is to either blow the whistle on what they're actually doing and you know, <laughs> maybe make an interesting thing about that, or go fix the damn thing, or maybe blow the whistle and then fix it. We hope. And maybe at the same time we discover that Wasabi is also the say I and the Well, but their architecture means that provided the software actually works as advertised, which of course it's open source software, so everyone's mm -hmm. welcome to look. Yeah. They I, do not learn much. I mean they use cryptography to prevent learning about this stuff, plus they use Tor. The fact is, Wasabi, unless the software has a serious crypto break in it. They just do not learn very much for the coin joins. It's also why I don't really care that they may go and use some chain analysis API behind the scenes. Because after all, the information that the chain analysis API is getting is no different from the information on the blockchain with you know minor technical differences about timing and stuff. It's basically the same data. Yeah. And uh, the company be f uh, behind us, uh, Wasabi, for those that don't know, it's ZK Snacks. This, 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 this. ZK Snacks, yeah. yeah. Like, um, all right, so that settles it for Peter, I guess. And, yeah, uh, don't use Scamerai, end of story. <laughs> use Wasabi, use Join Market, run your own coordinator if you want to use Wasabi and are paranoid. Yeah, if you're paranoid. Make your own coin join, use like 
maybe some lightning thing with coin joins in the future as people implement more, but... And then don't fuck up at the bases. Buy non-KYC earn it through your job. Well, and, I mean... Yeah, that, that's a, like the buying KYC stuff, I, I don't think it's necessarily the end of the world, mm -hmm. um, particularly if you're buying large amounts, because if you are buying large amounts and you are subject to an audit, mm -hmm. there's lots of ways they can go and look at what your income is and what your expenses are and say, hang on a second. You know, your income is this, your expenses are this, your savings are this. Where the heck did all that extra money go? No, okay, I mean, you'd be better off, you know, doing political lobbying so the KYC versus non-KYC thing doesn't matter. It won't, but they're still going to get the KYC up to the first cent. You know, you, we have that in Europe, you know, it's coming everywhere. Well, but, you know, again, like, s stop thinking you're only going to fight this with tech. You also got to fight this with politics. All right. Look, if you, only, if you don't fight with politics, there is no limit to what kind of KYC they can force. Because oh, they can do the, things they like... They will ask the expub of every single wallet. They will infiltrate Ledger if they've not done it already. Well, and more importantly, no, no, not just that. More importantly, they can also make it impossible for you to install other software by controlling computers. Not true. Like, I'm sorry, but there is no alternative here other than also fighting this at the political level. You know, if you've never written a letter to your politician, I'm sorry, you should go fix that. Uh, yeah, I'm doing pedagogy to them. I'm trying to explain yeah. them Bitcoin. It's, uh, the and thing And also, I, I mean, you have to go and promote freedom in general. Like, there is a tendency in a lot of societies to just discount freedom and just move towards more and more authoritarian societies. And not just about, like, Bitcoin's good. It's that, in general, freedom's good. Yeah, I know. And a lot of people are, do not believe that anymore. I was actually uh, weird, because, well, in France, it's always weird, but um, some kids were investigated to be a, a terrorist organization because they were using tails, tolls, yep. and uh, encryption, and signal. And in the report, it was like, they have forced their mom to use signal as a messaging app. And that was a reason to, like, do mass surveillance on them. Yeah. Those officers, a future government should go take them up to the wall and shoot them. It is just so egregious doing that. But, you know, this is why we have to win the political battles, too, because there is no limit to what kind of power states have yeah, if we lose the politics. Yeah, okay. And so, speaking of uh, hardware politics, I mentioned Ledger recently, well, which is, a, well, everyone knows what Ledger is. Um, what do you... What's your point of view of the recent drama they had uh, with the release of their new solution and then the fact that, all right, we all knew it wasn't open source, but there was some kind of trust on the reason why yeah, it was well, kind of broken up. Ledger is a really good example of how systems that can auto-update are very dangerous. There's a very good reason why Bitcoin Core does not have auto-updates. And there's also equally a lesson in how just updating in general is potentially dangerous. I mean, unless you are sure what new software you have, there's all kinds of things that could be in there, and you wouldn't necessarily know. And hardware wallets are not magic. As long as they are a single, you know, as long as you're using them as a single factor, which a lot of people do, you're trusting the hardware wallet. End of story. The hardware wallet can do anything it wants to your coins, including take it. And there's not much you can do about that unless you use things like multisig. Would you say that even like open source uh, solution like Colcard and even going for, uh, even further with like open source security chip like Trezor is trying to implement? Well, would like, uh, uh, it's more, more important to use multisig yeah. where you are not just relying on the hardware wallet. You are also have a separate key in a different system. Preferably multisig where the two different systems are made by different teams. Mm. And I'm not sure anyone's really done that in a nice user friendly way. Like, it would be very nice if, for instance, like Trezor and some completely different company got together and said, hey, we will create a standard so our wallets can work together to with multi-sig. Well, you could use like um, Sparrow or Spectre because they have a nice UX and you connect uh, like uh, one Trezor, one Ledger and uh, one call card and you create your multi-sig from there. You get like um, yeah. the output trans transactor. And then uh, that's it. You have like three different hardware providers, three different. But how software. easy is this to actually use in practice? Is at least what it's, 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 I mean. It got I, way I, easier. I, I may be out of date, yeah. but at least last I time I saw this, it wasn't. It was not easy. Being yeah. doing a lot yeah. of pedagogy and tutorials, it got way easier yeah. nowadays. Uh, certainly, when I looked into this, like maybe a year and a half ago or so, it yeah, still it wasn't, wasn't there. there. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's getting easier. And also, the issue with multisig was like the backup 
uh, phase because before, like two years ago, they were telling us to keep every expert so we can recreate yes, the whole yeah. uh, script. Yeah. But now there's like the output uh, descriptor that is way easier to yeah. store. So it does get better, but yeah. I don't think the mass, the masses are ready for multi-sig. Yeah, it has to be fixed. Yeah, it's just I, one of those things. I mean, of course, one of the things that will help this is also to make multi-sig the same price, which Taproot can do. Yeah, that's true. And yeah. also more private with Taproot. Yeah, yeah. It isn't always what you want. I mean, there are cases where, for accountability, you want to know who actually signed. But and you can know it even though it, you don't well, reveal it on the, the well, blockchain, Well, I right? mean, well, but there are cases where revealing on the blockchain is really what you want. Okay. Because, yes, you can go keep logs of who was supposed to sign, but if something gets compromised, you don't necessarily, like, you can't necessarily trust those logs. Yeah, okay, that's true. So you certain, them yeah. Things. Yeah, but you know, I think that's more applicable to things like, you know, corporations holding huge amounts of coins, where they really need that level of auditing for you know you and your, you and your multi you know hardware device in a multi sig. It's a different story. Mm, that's true. So, uh, which uh, hardware would you recommend to to people? I know we talked about uh, seed signer during your classes. <sighs> well, you know, I mean, from a philosophy point of view, seed signer is definitely there. Of course, personally, I don't use any of this stuff. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't basically don't use hardware wallets. I have a bunch of them, a lot because people just give them to me. But, you know, I personally don't really use them because I don't trust that model that up until and quite recently has been, hey, you just go trust the hardware device. Now, I think that may change, but I haven't bothered to get into this That's yet. Sure. You know, for large amounts of Bitcoin, I personally do things like, say, get a laptop and just buy it and put Linux on it and only use it for that purpose. And at least with that type of approach, the supply chain that went into this, nothing other than the software itself was known by the supplier to be used for Bitcoin. Yeah, it was on the lesson you gave to the kids at Kubo yeah. Plus. It was like, uh, because there's so many laptops, it wasn't targeted for Bitcoiners. Well, yes. All yep. the other uh, hardware yep. are targeted yep. toward us. Or in the case of something like Seed Signer, because it can run on off-the-shelf hardware, mm -hmm. something that you just buy anywhere, it's not a you know it's a not the same kind of target that say a ledger sitting in a box at the post office is. Exactly. And I, I, especially ledger, we got uh, all the, our data uh, leaked. So yes, uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> also that terrible. is not a good sign. That that says a lot about how sloppy that company uh, must be. Yeah, at uh, multiple uh, times, but um, yeah. sadly, the percentage of people using hardware wallet is low, and among those people, it's like ninety-two percent is like Ledger. So they even yeah. have a monopoly on hardware wallets, which well, they don't have a monopoly. What? They don't have a monopoly. Maybe two percent is a monopoly. Yeah. Okay. Right. They're, they're, not, they're, they're not forcing other people not to. There's right? a lot of they're, competition. Yeah. They're trying. Yeah. There, there isn't hardware wallets. Don't have a. A monopoly economics going on. Yeah. Ledger has just been pretty good at advertising, and, and I suspect a lot of it is because Ledger is very willing to support a lot more than Bitcoin. Yeah, that's actually quite yeah. true. What's your stand on the wallet that do Bitcoin only and wallet that do altcoin on the security standpoint? Is it well, really true that just if, because if you price? if you care about Bitcoin, it is definitely a negative. It, oh, I should say, if you only care about Bitcoin, it's definitely a negative if the hardware wallet provider is spending a lot of resources supporting 50 other things. Yeah. I'm sorry, but you know, there's only so much engineering time in the day. That's and true. if you're spread thin, that's just how it's going to be. Yeah, so it's not even on the security of the device itself, but more on like the company doesn't, won't be fast enough to, improve, to implement all the changes that they could. Well, it's just unlikely that they're going to spend the same amount of time and attention um, for, you know, for the resources they have. Now, you know, maybe you could argue the wall in spite of that, maybe Ledger is doing better. But remind me again, what was the company that just accidentally leaked their customer lists? Too bad. Like, it's a sign. It may not be directly the programming, but it is a sign that something's wrong at that company. Yeah. So, like, speaking of uh, hardware and so company that could leak, I, I was like, all right, so we talked about the hot wallet, we talked about the cold wallet, and now I'm seeing it. Well, we tell people to run Node, you know? We tell you almost at every video, hey, guys, you should run the Node. Yeah. Uh, the question is always, which node? Because a lot of people are like, should it just get an old laptop and install Bitcoin Core? Well, uh, a point I like to make is a Bitcoin Core node is just a piece of software. Mm -hmm. There's no reason why you shouldn't run it on your main desktop or laptop or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, how, how much RAM would it take? 
Well, I mean, it depends on um, how it's set up. But, yeah. you know, when it, while it's running, I mean, it's like a gig or two of RAM. It's yeah. really not that much. And in terms of disk space, it's a per node. It's, yeah, it's you know, enough. it's under 10 gigs. All right, so you'd actually advise to get it on your main live um, work tools? Instead well, I mean, of why, wouldn't, it, like, uh, why wouldn't you have one? In your house? Well, I mean, why wouldn't you have one installed? It's sometimes useful. If you want to download a timestamp with open timestamps and verify it, it'll be right there. I guess. Like, would... I, I would kind of call a Bitcoin node sort of a basic service of a computer. Because, well, it's less, you know, it's not really that true today. But in the future, I'd expect tons of things to... To ask for yeah. Your, yeah. Yeah, to just ask the local Bitcoin node, hey, you know, does this block actually exist? If it does, okay, great. Now I can verify a timestamp or yeah, some other type cool. of proof. I guess the issue here is that a lot of people know they are mixing Lightning Node and Bitcoin Node as just one thing. And so they would be like, oh, I need my Lightning Node and Bitcoin Node at home. And they won't bother to have a only... Because if you have a Lightning Node on your main um, uh, laptop, you're going to call it all the time. And so you cannot use it. You need a real, reliable well, uh, piece of software well, that Well, that isn't actually necessarily true. I mean, with watchtowers, it's reasonable to have a Lightning Node that's turned off because the watchtower will go and punish the counterparty. Yeah. Now, has that really it's been properly tested? It's well, well, annoying I, well, on the routing uh, stats than you would have. Like your well, but I mean, like, you, you are running yeah, you a node because you want to make a lightning payment. Yeah, that's true. You're not, not because you're trying to make money. Okay, that's like, true. Like, I run a lightning node at a professional interest that has lots of liquidity, et cetera, et cetera. You know, how much money do I make per day? Oh, well. No. You know, if I'm having a really good day, maybe a dollar. And it's running on a VPS that costs me like $75 a month. Yeah, no. I mean, it, I am not expecting to make money on that. And I put more effort into it than is reasonable for any normal person. Like it's, the fact is, because people are running so many lightning nodes, the cost of routing gets pushed down. But that, would that not be a massive flow for the economics and the game theory of lightning and its growth in the future if it's not reliably economical, uh, va va valuable? To, to run a node, why would people lock liquidity, take the risk of the moment the, the moment people chain? stop putting so much liquidity into Lightning, routing prices will go up, and then it'll so balance there's, out. There's right? just too much liquidity wasted there. Well, it's, it's not wasted. It's just people like me are just th pissing away some money because they don't care. I mean, lots of people run Lightning nodes that they're not making a profit on, and that's okay. They choose to run it. I mean, every Bitcoin node running. Yeah. It, you're not making money on it. No, I know. But it's still useful to you. For me, having a lightning node it's is useful. useful. To, the, to the network. Well, I mean, A, I can go learn stuff about it, and B, yeah, I'm, I'm con I know I'm contributing to the network. That's fine. I'm okay with that. Yeah, but it, we Also, can... remember, there's a lot of companies, too, who, if you want to send and receive lightning payments, it often makes sense to run a node, even if you're not going to make profit on routing. Yeah, because it. you have a service. Yeah. But, like, I'm more questioning like the economics of Lightning. Um, we all know how Bitcoin economics works with the miners and why it's really important that the fees go up as time because, well, they're, they're literally sick. Well, the I mean, network. that's that's a whole other. I mean, Bitcoin's kind of broken that way. It's very, it's so stupid. Oh, yeah, I remember the talk at Riga. You were saying, yeah. and you may go on, that uh, Bitcoin is broken and because right now it works well, yeah, because yeah, we print not, money, well, but we're going to stop. The thing with Bitcoin there is that Bitcoin is making a very risky bet. Yeah. that fees will go pay for security. And there's two big problems with this bet. One is the sort of general problem of it's not really clear fees will pay for security, at least to the level we need. And then the second problem with it is for technical reasons, having fees be the only incentive to create a block has all kinds of game theory problems at, you know, it, do miners always want to create a new block? Maybe sometimes they want to reorg it. You know, that kind of gets into weeds of exactly how Bitcoin works. But the bigger picture I'd say is, well, look, Bitcoin's this extremely valuable thing. It's like, you know, in 10 years, it'll probably be like $10 trillion asset, maybe yeah. more, you know. Why on earth would you go risk trillions and trillions of dollars worth of value in exchange from going from like, you know, 0.1% inflation to 0.0? 0.1% inflation is a 0.1% tax to make sure your Bitcoin are safe. 0.1% compounded over 50 years is something like, you know, 5, 10%. Who cares? But they would argue that the fact that Bitcoin has that value that you said, like 10 trillion, is because it doesn't have inflation. And those people are stupid, and they do not understand economics. The difference between 0% inflation and like 5% over your entire lifetime is completely insignificant. 
Had, had Satoshi released Bitcoin from day zero with, you know, 50 Bitcoin per block forever, Bitcoin would be every bit as valuable as it is today. Because what would have happened is the narratives we would have created around a store of value and a fixed supply and all this would have worked all the same way. Like, it is a fixed supply. Yeah, it's a fixed supply. It with creates inflation. a fixed amount. Yeah, but with inflation. So? And in fact, of course, you don't end up having inflation because if you have tail emission, the rate of economic inflation, yeah, like of course, yeah, it ends up meeting up with lost coins. Like, that's just how this stuff works. And again, the difference between, you know, 0.5% and zero, who really cares? Like, why are you so worried about even like 1%? Don't you have confidence Bitcoin's going to go up in value more than like 1% per year? I mean, that would be enough to completely wipe out. And right now, of course, Bitcoin has like 1.5% inflation. And yet we're all, you know, panicking over this. It's just a very dumb, misguided, high time preference optimization that doesn't make any sense. But yeah, we're never going to change it. Yeah, we can. We can do a Demarage soft fork, which is the same thing. You know we're never going to make it. I would not bet on that. You do? You think? Miners could easily do a Demarage soft fork, and they can do it in such a way where wallets aren't really going to notice. Like if miners, well basically, so for the audience, Demarage soft fork means that when you spend your coins, mm -hmm. a tax is applied based on the value of that coin and how long it's been in existence. Economically, this is the same thing as inflation. Inflation is a tax on savings. Yeah. Well, that is a tax on savings. It, the only difference is you create it when it gets spent. And to implement this in a useful way, you would take that tax, you would create, you would, in the protocol, say that a coin-based output has been created mm -hmm. that's spendable by all miners, but in a gradual way. So you're basically creating a pool of funds that all miners gradually take away and now this spreads out that revenue over many many blocks you know something like say a year worth of blocks so that miners always have an incentive to move the chain forward and if you implement it this way it's basically the same thing as tail emission because tail emission works out to be taking money from the coins that are in economic use coins that are not lost mm -hmm. this is just doing that in a very direct way because of course they have to be spent for this to apply Miners can do this because wallets deal with fees that change. Fees have gone from like four cents to like twenty dollars in the past year, and then back again. Well, not quite back again, but because we have things like replace by fee, and because we deal with mempools that are full and all this, wallets can deal with. Oh, that's funny. Well, I want a bigger fee to get my transaction. Well, I'll just do replace by fee, or I'll just pay a bigger fee. It would work just fine. And you probably wouldn't even notice because, again, like 0.1% per year is nothing. Yeah, I see your point. I see your point. I don't know. Someone just has to implement this, and we just have to wait a while for Bitcoin's 1.5% inflation to get lower. You know, maybe in 10 years this will happen. Yeah, so what would be the risk, in your opinion, if on your security thread model you start, the fee doesn't go up? So the, the substitute go down, well, and at there's that one, point we cross well, the road, and every Bitcoin uh, believe it will go up, and it just well remember. Stable. So one obvious problem here is that mining pays for fifty one percent security, and that is a public good because it means that if some dude with a pile of money wants to destroy Bitcoin, the number of dudes out there with that much money is very small. Yeah, hopefully zero. And the problem with 51% attacks is for something like Bitcoin, it's not clear Bitcoin can survive 51% attack. That may be enough to collapse confidence in it, which of course reduces the price, which of course reduces the hash power, and then you create a spiral that just kills it. Yeah, and then we try to fork and move and press the button. Yeah, button, and, and, and like because it's a, it's Bitcoin's the biggest, like if the biggest cryptocurrency can be killed, well, I mean, what about all the other ones? Maybe they can be killed too. No. You know, this could kill the whole thing, which is why you want to send an amount of money that's affordable to 51% tax secure. We don't really know who the 51% attackers could be. It's very hard to estimate this stuff. But hey, something like say 0.1% or currently of course 1.5%, it's certainly affordable because Bitcoin price keeps going up. So it's good that we send that to it. Now from a technical point of view, ignoring that consideration, if fees are a significant percentage 
of total block reward. In particular, if fees are consistently more than total block reward, you can easily be in a situation where a miner might say, hang on a second, why am I trying to mine the next block okay. with all these low fees when the previous block had a lot of fees? Why don't I just go reorg that block and hope I get another one? Yeah. Now, if you're a, you know, approximately 0% miner, you're never going to do that. Because you have 5, 10, you get a chance. Exactly. Once you have, say, 30% hashing power, like it's starting to look pretty attractive to do this. And we really do not want to be in a position where miners with, you know, 20, 30% hashing power make more money per unit hashing power than miners with 1%. We already have other reasons why that's kind of true, but we don't want to keep on adding them. And we really don't want to have a really strong reason like, yeah, it's the only way you can earn money on fees. That would be a disaster for Bitcoin. It is far better if fees are actually a smaller component and there's just constantly revenue, no matter what, under any circumstance, just make the next block. Considering that what you want is probably not going to happen. So I don't think tough. so. We're talking, about 10 years. We're, we're talking 10 years out. A lot can change in 10 years. Right now, right now Bitcoin's inflation rate is 1.5% approximately. It takes a long time for it to get down to the point where this stuff really starts to matter. I know, but the ethos of most of the newcomers... It doesn't matter what the is, ethos is. You can do it with a soft fork. Miners can do it without permission of everyone else. If miners, who frankly are politically a separate group in Bitcoin, yeah. and they increasingly act like a, as a separate thing, if they say, well, screw you guys, we want to do this, there's not that much that nodes can really do other than yell about it, especially when there's good reasons for it. I mean, it's one thing if they say we're willing to like kill you were Bitcoin. You were talking about like confidence. If that happened, the confidence. And why would the really confidence shake. be bad? It's just a small tax. Yeah, but you know how the point you could Look, make, and I, I do agree, tax. is that not enough Bitcoiners by then would be like hardcore libertarian that for taxation is theft. That their voice and their node would be the people too are, few compared the to people, most of the people. Well, of course, their that. node can't stop this unless they do the really hard thing of forking Bitcoin. Which they would at that point. And then will people follow? Because there's a hell of a lot more... That's going to be politics. Well, there's a hell of a lot more reasonable people. I mean, my impression, talk, like what I've found personally talking about inflation and these kinds of issues is there's a real hardcore group of people who really hate me. Yeah, I know. And there are a much, seems to be a much larger group of people who more quietly come up, yeah, yeah, you're obviously right. And it would be much nicer if Bitcoin had done this right to begin with. But there's a difference between saying, yeah, all right, you're right, but Bitcoin didn't do it, so no, it's like but too late to it. change. But we can change it. Like I say, Demarage, you can change. And if, if Again, it doesn't matter about risky, it's that miners can go and do this. If <sighs> miners are in a position where, ah, uh, shit, you know, this is actually causing problems, like blocks are occasionally getting reorged, it's very easy for them to say, you know what, we as a group, to be exact, we, 50% as a group, yeah. should collectively say, this is bad, we should fix this. And if hashing power looks like what it looks like now... It's going to be 10 times higher by then. Well, but hang on, hang on, hang on. But in terms of, the... hang on, but in terms of percentage, right now we basically have one pool or two pools with enough, like basically, you know, we tend to have basically two pools with either 50, over 51% or close yeah, to yeah, it. Yeah. It wouldn't take much for people to say, you know what, we got to just do this and force this. And provided someone actually writes the code and creates a good implementation, yeah, you might wake up tomorrow. Plus, it can You're be done slowly. You're become the enemy of some Bitcoiners. Well, I'm already the enemy a lot. I mean, that's true. I, I wish I was wearing my full RBF. <laughs> and again, that's another example where miners said... I, I do said, the same, by the way. So well, I do. Full RBF is another example where miners said, you know what? That group of Bitcoiners, you're just wrong. We don't believe in your opinion. And we're going to use the fact that we can do this to screw you over. In fact, um, the first pool that, re uh, for at least recently, turned on full RBF, they kind of jokingly told me, well, you know, one of the reasons we did this is we hate John Carvalho. <laughs> screw that guy. We'll just flip the switch, turn it on. It's easy. And since then, I think... Like Luxor has it on, Antpool has it on, and Antpool is big. Yeah. Um, Binance Pool, at least on some of their hashing power, has it on. Um, EMCD Pool has it on. They're kind of small, but they're sometimes. Like, their hash rate goes up and down yeah. for odd reasons. We're not really sure why. And then Poolin, I believe, yeah, five-ish, six -ish pools, probably with like 10, 15% hashing power. That's more than enough to tell the 
Yeah, but that's, so it's quite funny. So I want to talk about two things. Uh, Stratum V2, because you were talking about pools. Yeah. But before that, back at the big box, it was like the minor against the people, and the people won. I'm making it super easy well, for the Well, they won, though, they won saying, for like, a specific we, we reason. We back at that. But, but, but you got to remember, big blocks are a different type of change. Big blocks are hard fork. Yeah. Yeah. Soft forks are very different politi politically than hard forks. Yeah, true. What's, uh, for you, the good way to implement a soft fork? You know, like, when... Uh, it depends on the circumstances. Yeah. Um, in terms, so, if, you're pers if what you're looking at is total risk yeah. of a fork, the obvious way to do a soft fork is to have it minor activated. Yeah, okay. But that isn't necessarily the lowest risk, depending on the circumstances. I mean, maybe if what you're maybe what you're doing is something which is controversial to miners, and maybe you'd be better off doing user activated soft fork. I mean, maybe the future of Bitcoin itself is at risk. Like the user activated soft fork that got SegWit implemented. Of course, you got to remember the way that actually worked is people made a big fuss about it, and then miners turned on SegWit. So we have no idea if the UASF worked. But from the point of view of turning on SegWit, it did work. Because it was a big gun to the head of miners saying, yeah. hey, if you go and dick around with this, like this could happen and it will be a giant mess. Why don't you just turn on this SegWit thing that all of us guys say is a good idea? Whereas Demirage would be a very different situation because, the miner, because the miner, yeah, the miners can just go do it. And then the users, well, they would have to take an active step to fork off Bitcoin with a hard fork and then say, no, no, this is Bitcoin. And, then, yeah. and that's a mess. And at that point, it will be super tough because most of the, a lot now of Bitcoin are going to be owned by institution with the NTF and all that shit. So then those guys are also well, entering into the political game. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't assume that owned by institutions means that they're the ones in control in terms of politics. Not in politics, but they do clearly say that in case of fork, they will be the one deciding which side, uh, which, which chain they would use, even but, though but it's keep less mind, economically I mean, valuable. A lot of stuff owned by institutions, of course, it is actually subject to voting by the people who tr are the true beneficial owners. Yeah. So, you know, this, this is a complex topic, and I would not, like... It's another level yeah, of well, politics well, we're getting you know, into. if BlackRock gets their ETF, that doesn't necessarily mean BlackRock calls the shots. BlackRock may instead end up with a complex, annoying process to do ballot, you know, do, do voting among their shareholders, which is how most corporate stuff works. You know, I mean, I have some stocks for various reasons, and I wind up getting ballots in the mail like once a month. That's true, actually. Yeah. Straight up V2. Well, be good to have. Good to have, like it. Will it solve some issue on pool centralization? Or uh, I mean, it makes it less of a problem. Um, of course, the, the number one thing is that, there. Well, I'll say the number one thing that makes pool centralization less of a problem is the simple fact that miners can switch pools. Like the fact that that's reasonably easy is a huge, a huge help because it does mean that bad behavior by pools can be punished by miners just saying, well, screw that, we're going to go somewhere else. Now, stratum V2 would be nice to have. And I think it would do, it will, I mean, I pointed out how it would do some interesting things with things like full RBF where allowing some transactions get mined matters. And there aren't too many examples of that because most, most of the time people don't make systems that are so busted that the presence of a transaction can break their system. But there are some things. Now, Stratum V2 is nice, but I am much more excited personally about uh, people's efforts to fix up P2 pool. Okay. You know, I've heard some interesting ideas around um, like braids and whatnot that seem plausible. Um, someone's got to actually implement all this, but I'm really hoping that gets implemented because, you know, personally, when I mined way back in the day, I'd mined on P2 pool. What would it take to be uh, created? And that I don't know that topic this much. Uh, my understanding is basically someone's got to write a whole lot of very careful to write code with very high stakes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this isn't easy, but. At, at least based on the presentation or two I've seen, it seemed like there are some good ideas there. But someone's got to sit down and do a whole lot of work. And this might be something where, you know, someone needs funding for it. Yeah, so often like that. Speaking of like solution for mining, uh, it was also like Jack Dorsey, I think, that was trying to help on the ASICs and be, be able to, to mine on a different type of hardware that what uh, we're used to, to try to decentralize the hash rate on a lower base. 
But again, well, I mean, of course, you know, ASICs always have this problem that ultimately they go back yeah. to chip fabs. But it would be nice to have more, at least, ASIC designers, even if the actual manufacturing of the actual chips ends up all at you know TSMC and maybe a few others. But it, it is unfortunate that um, Intel they were going to do get into Bitcoin mining. Seems yeah, that they've they canceled stopped. that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what about Blockstream? They wanted to, right? Also. I I think they're still working on this stuff, but it's a very challenging thing to do. Um, you know. Margins are very small, and one of the um, maybe less obvious things about Bitcoin ASICs is they really, really push the limits of what silicon can do. Yeah. And there just aren't many things in silicon design where all your power goes into doing one operation over and over again as fast as possible. That's just not something that happens very often. Like your, you know, your CPU and your machine. Most of the silicon at any one time is not doing anything at all. Mm -hmm. It's just there in case some operation needs to be done. And while that's a very fast approach overall, it looks nothing like what a Bitcoin ASIC looks like, where every single thing is doing the same thing over and over again. And apparently one of the problems it causes is you know, modern chips, the, a lot of engineering goes into planning power, which of course means planning heat. Well. The tools that plan this stuff often don't know how to estimate that kind of usage. And if they don't know how to estimate it properly, well, you might wind up with a design that doesn't actually work in practice. And there goes $100 million, because that's basically what the cost is for a top-of-the-line run of chips. $100 million setup fee. Well, and also, we've kind of reached, uh, not the limitation of ASICs, but the, the, the growth space of the specialty is going to be so much lower through the time. Like we. In my opinion, I know we. I feel like keep in mind sense. though that can be a good thing because what one it won't of, give well, such an advantage to people that do acquire. The yeah, new well, or, or maybe another way to go put it is it makes mining more commodity, mm -hmm. so that the hardware isn't as important. Yeah, because okay. these more. Yeah. yeah, like for instance, if we're in a position where in the past, say, as an example, ten years, the top of the line Bitcoin ASIC has been the same and it's been in production for 10 years, yeah. well, that will mean we have a much bigger set of hardware out in the field mm -hmm. versus annual production, which makes it harder for someone to buy up enough production, 51% attack. So much harder. Yeah. It also means that people will have more time to amortize their hardware, which pushes the cost down to, well, who has cheap electricity and a way to get rid of the heat or preferably do something useful. Indeed. Well, the reality is power and cheap cooling or use of the heat is inherently decentralized. Yeah. It's actually funny, you don't know it, but uh, we, so we have a course in the, our university, it's called Mining 201, yeah. and within we are teaching our students to transform an S9 into yeah. a home heater. Yeah. So we modify yeah. the software using brains to, make, to underclock it and overclock it, we change the fence to yeah. a, a gaming fence yeah. so it doesn't make noise. Uh, yeah. and we put it at a lower pace because the ASICs has to run yeah. as fast as possible. Well, I'll point out actually, um, Europe, ha well, it basically most of the world other than North America has a subtle advantage with this, which is they have 220 volt power yeah. and a wall outlet gets a lot more wattage. And for various reasons, the power that each individual ASIC box consumes has tended to be optimized for 220 volt outlets or 240 volt outlets, depending on where you are. And that's just not something that a North American outlet can provide. You know, you need a special circuit, which makes the barrier to entry for mining a lot bigger. Now, obviously, you can underclock and you do things like that, but it's not as nice as in Europe where you just plug one in and, just, and that's that. That's true. Um, speaking of, uh, so that's really like home mining. Even though we would love to see everyone home mine, it won't be enough ash rate to compensate for like big players because I S9, wouldn't bet on that. You think it could work? Yeah, the thing, again, the thing is... Like, the idea that, is that, okay, is that we, we teach people to well, have like just a well, S9 first of all, and then move to home mining does not make sense in a lot of places because they do not need the heat or they're in a position where heat pumps work better. Mm -hmm. And homes in lots of places just have expensive power. Now, where it does make sense is Schools. things like solar. All right. You know, if you happen to have a pile of solar panels on your roof and the incremental cost of adding Bitcoin mining is cheap enough, yeah, absolutely you should go put a Bitcoin miner in because sometimes the power is wasted. And that is inherently decentralized. 
it's not quite home mining in the same way, but it also is home mining. Oh, it is home mining. Right? Depending on where you are. And collectively, if a lot of people do this, they will go and outpace, quote unquote, you know, big miners. Well, think about it. If you're trying to be a big miner purchasing power that will probably be provided most cheaply by renewables, you are going to spend more money than the guy putting the miner right there because in between you know, his solar panel and your mine is a whole lot of wire. That wire costs money. Transmission of electricity is expensive. And at the limit, it's far cheaper to put the miner right on the solar panel, or at least close to it, than it is to put it you know, 10 kilometers away. Yeah. I also see we're going to see a shift. Um, well, the, the entire energy market is going to merge at some point with the mining market. And that's going to be a, a fascinating thing. Well, to some thing. extent. To uh, some extent. Yeah. But the, 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 keep in mind, though, in a lot of places that won't happen, because in a lot of places, power costs are just going to be higher than the lower place in the world. Like, like it or not, there's a lot of places where solar just sucks, yeah. where you know, hydro isn't available. They'll probably run on stuff like nuclear. And for mature energy markets, they will probably just permanently wind up with higher prices and thus not very much Bitcoin mining. But in a place that's sunny, as an example, solar is cheap, yeah, I'd expect tons of people to Bitcoin miners at, at the limit. Yeah, I was uh, thinking like uh, there's a whole mining, even though it's solar on your roof, but also like bigger building, like a uh, high school, build, uh, like swimming pool, all those stuff, they will at the end plug some S19. Uh, in their own system, energy system, would you say? Why? Why wouldn't they? Why would they? Well, they need to heat their home, and at the but end of the day, the energy pumps. is spent to heat. They can use heat pumps. Heat pumps are more than 100% efficient. That, that, that's the and thing. It could be more expensive than... Uh, well, it, you ASICs make money, are expensive. But with the ASICs, they will make money, so they will have some... But yeah, but at action. the limit, There's a limit. It's, it's likely that this stuff will go move to solar. I mean, it, it depends on the circumstance. Um, you know, there may be somewhere in between. But everyone who goes and says that Bitcoin miners are automatically the right solution for heating because they make money and they're 100% efficient, they're just wrong because heat pumps are more than 100% efficient. And that dichotomy gets worse on bigger scales. Because if, you know, say as an example, I'm heating a shed, one tiny little shed. Installing a heat pump is going to be reasonably expensive. I may not have a great source of heat energy to put into that shed, et cetera, et cetera. Now, on the other hand, let's suppose I'm heating a university. A university that happens to be next to a lake. I can afford to spend $10 million to put pipes out in the lake, take the heat out of the lake itself. And that's very high capital, but it does give me extremely good energy return on investment and ultimately at that, high, at that level of consumption, very cheap heat. That's actually what Bitcoin is competing with. And I suspect what will happen is more the opposite. Bitcoin heating makes sense on a small scale. I mean, a really good example actually where it makes sense is things like older houses, mm -hmm. where you may not want a heat pump because it will screw with architecture. Yeah. Like your walls may not be arranged in the right way. I mean, in those cases, yeah, like having a small quiet panel that just magically makes heat makes a ton of sense. But you know, when you're talking about a university or some other big institution which can afford to do things like ground source heat, it's a very different discussion. Yeah, all right. Yeah, it does make sense. And what about uh, state level mining? When do you? Well, it's already happening. Let's assume it's already happening. Uh, when? What? Where do you see that going uh, in the future? Sorry, what? what? States uh, level. Oh, mining. state level mining. I don't think it makes very much sense. No? Um, yeah, like, it's kind of like asking, where do you see like state-level power production? I mean, so yeah, okay, maybe it will make sense sometimes, but why wouldn't you just let the you know, market handle it? I mean, why, why is the state putting money into this because the market I'm can do Because I'm it? French, and so obviously all the nuclear plants are owned by the state. So at that point... I'm yeah, but that's, a, but that's a very special situ situation. I mean, it, it, so a counterexample of this is I've heard proposals in Canada to have mining as a way of making the economics of small nuclear work. Mm -hmm. And in that model, well, of course, obviously, the state will license the nuclear plant, will do the regulatory yeah. stuff. The community would own the plant, and they... And they would be the ones receiving the money from the Bitcoin. And well, why would they do all this? Well, because it means that you can install one plant that's oversized to meet the needs of the community in 10 years rather than 
having a much more, exp you know, having a plant that you're not making enough money on and not necessarily being able to afford it. And of course, in this kind of model, in 10 years, once community is bigger and needs more power, they'll probably throw away the Bitcoin miners or yeah. sell them or something like that. Yeah. But in all that, I mean, why would the state get involved in it? Like, it's a financial decision based on the power. We could argue that they want to accumulate, accumulate Bitcoins. But you're gonna why don't say, they just buy it? Yeah, I was going to say, why don't they just print and buy like, it? A lot of people have the idea that they'll mine to accumulate Bitcoins. And other than special circumstances, that tends to be a terrible idea. Just buy them. Let someone else go and do that bit. That's true. You know, there are exceptions. I mean, there are cases, like, so a good example of like capital controls. There have been cases, uh, parent, supposedly China was one of them, where you could buy hardware to mine Bitcoin, but you couldn't directly buy Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And in that case, yeah, you might pay a huge premium on your Bitcoin. And more but, risk. Yeah, but you're still paying a premium for this when you could have just, in normal circumstances, bought it. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Okay, okay. Uh, man, interesting, so interesting. Uh, I think we've talked about a lot of things. We talked about manufacturing, mining, yep. hardware, software, uh, forks. We've talked about uh, dev. What would be like the most, yeah, no, I already asked that. What was the thing you wanted to see? Damn, uh, we talked about drama, politics. I hope you enjoyed it, actually. It was a really fun discussion. Uh, I guess to finish, I would have one last question. Are you on Noster? Or are I you am, but I, I am, but I don't think like Noster is a very well designed system. I know, why? It's because Noster in practice is quite centralized. Like Nostra, so the, the big issue with Nostra is its architecture means that you have relays, but when I go give you my Nostra identity, there isn't really a good way for you to actually get messages from me without already being connected to the set of relays I'm connected to. So right there we have a problem. And on top of that problem, if a relay goes down, or if you're thinking a relay might go down, there aren't good ways to mirror the relay's messages without involving trust. Because relays in Nostra can censor and get away with it. The only way a relay will not get away with censorship is if you happen to be connecting to multiple ones at once. And the person happened to publish them, but the moment that's not true, you have no idea from your software point of view what things you're missing because Nostra messages, well, Nostra notes, are not put into something like blockchain. Now, there's another system kind of like Nostra, a few years old at this point, called Scuttlebutt. And it does this right because in Scuttlebutt, your stuff gets put into a basically per person blockchain. So if you're looking at the tip of my Scuttlebutt blockchain, mm -hmm. you can say, hang on a second. If I go backwards, I'm missing everything after that point. Where is it? Or, you know, I'm missing something in the middle. Where is it? That's a much better system to have. It deals far better with censorship. And Nostra just didn't do any of that. They knew about it when they created it, but they didn't do any of that because it made it simpler. And unfortunately, I think Nostra is an example where often things that are simple and broken get adoption because people think they're easy to use. It's not even that easy to use. <laughs> well, so, you know, the serialization of Nostra is a good example of this too. It, it's JSON, it looks easy to use, but getting it right is actually deceptively hard because different JSON interpreters disagree. Yeah. Can and it also, scale? No, not, not in its current design. Again, it's this relay problem. And it's even worse than things, like, so Mastodon has a scaling problem too in this yeah. sense. Like if I am an extremely popular Mastodon user, people will hammer my server asking for... All of that. Yeah, now obviously I can use standard web tech to scale that. But from my a, point of view... A lightning filter on sites to make sure like you filter who can. Uh, yeah, but I mean, ultimately the problem is that, you know, it's... Mastodon was designed that way. Now, Nostra makes this problem worse by not having this model of, you know, as much as one server per person. We all will end up on the same relays, and yeah, maybe we'll pay them, but that's a centralized, unscalable system. And keeping up those relays has turned out to be challenging. I mean, apparently a uh, relay run by, uh, what is this, uh, main iOS client. Anyway, you know, apparently one recent relay like shut down because paying 600 a month for web hosting wasn't really looking very viable. Yeah, that's true. What yeah. about Tor? Where, what is the stage of Tor? Well, Tor, remember, is an inherently centralized system. Yeah. And yeah, there's pluses and minuses there. One of the pluses is that because it's centralized, competent people are running it and can do things like 
apply manual in intervention to take Tor relays out of the consensus. And that is potentially a very good thing. You know, and to be clear, like Tor, you know, what it, way it works is there's something called directory authorities. And they are the people who decide what are or are not Tor relays. And they maintain a consensus among the, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, whatever number of directory relay, um, directory authorities. And then other people copy that data from that consensus. Now, Tor relays are independent, but it all goes back through these directory authorities. But like I say, from point of view of privacy, that, is a, that does have advantages. And there's been many times in Tor's history where people running it have said, hang on a second, all those relays look suspicious. You know, there's something about them. They often don't say what, but there's something about them that makes it look like maybe they're actually collecting traffic. Because remember, Tor's privacy tech. I can't prove to you I'm not keeping logs. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, on the onion routine. Yeah. Now, I2P doesn't work that way, but I2P has a disadvantage that it's much easier to Sybil attack and run a whole bunch of I2P nodes that go keep locks. And this is just a fundamental trade-off. Like, there's no way to easily get around this without using some very different thing than onion routing. Hmm. All right, all right, that's cool. Um, yeah, I was, uh, a last question I had in mind was asking about um, what you saw on the CBDCs and uh, countries creating their own cryptocurrency, like e euro. As you do consulting, have they ever uh, approached you? Or like, at <laughs> well, what stage? I, I like, mean, I, of course, you're, I, you're I, not I, saying I, I, Well, no, no, actually, I do have a funny story with that, which is uh, before, I mean, the name um, Central Bank Digital Currency really became a, a well-known yeah. thing. And I think this was back like 2014 or so. I got contacted by a client saying, well, you know, we want to go create this cash replacement blockchain and we're going to replace all cash in this country with this blockchain. And I go, I said, okay, well, I mean, what are, what are your design requirements? And they kind of go say, well, I mean, so we want to know the sender and receiver of everyone and we want that traceable back to government ID. And I say, okay, okay. So what else do you want? And he said, well, every time you make a transaction, we want the receipt uploaded to the chain. Not just who's paying. <laughs> they wanted to know what it was for. Right down to the detail of like, if you bought something at a bookstore, they wanted to know what book you bought. And I came, okay, okay, okay. Uh, so what, what country is this for? And they go, well, you know, I can't really say, you know, we're just the middleman. But I finally got them to admit it was like some dictatorship in Africa or something. I mean, like, dude, it's pretty obvious what's happening. The dictator wants to stamp out whatever remaining political opposition they have by just tracking everyone. And, you know, I don't think I said it, but obviously they wanted the ability to go press a button and yeah. turn people's accounts off. Yeah, obviously. and cancel a payment. Yeah, and yeah. yeah. We move money. Yeah, yeah. it's, you know, that's just so utterly unethical. And, and yet, yeah, it's pushing everywhere. Well, there's a lot of very unethical people in government who are just drunk with power and want more. It's as simple as that. It is a job that attracts terrible fascist people who are just bad for humanity. I mean, that, that's just how it is. And the only thing we can really do is A, avoid it in things like Bitcoin, and B, at the political level, make sure that human rights level laws are clear about this and track those people down and, in a lot of cases, put them in jail and shoot them. Like, that's, that's how this stuff works. You look at the history of the U.S., well, how did they wind up a free country and not under the thumb of the British? Well, they revolted. That's just the kind of thing that has to happen. And it would be good if countries would more generally say, yeah, freedom of money is just another type of freedom of speech. It is completely unacceptable to have central bank digital currencies that go track everything. I'm sorry, but that has to be part of the humanity's consensus on what rights people have. Amen. De definitely, guys. Uh, that's why we're here, literally. That's why we're building. That's why we're working. That's why we're te teaching you the tools. So you can take back control, you know what you're talking about, you can explain to your family, your friends, your local politicians, you can set up as a group and try to organize. So we but don't, don't be naive, up. Bitcoin alone is not enough. I know, Cree. It is not enough. I agree. Like, it, there's a good chance, even in the EU, they will come down with some central bank digital currency. In every they might country. say that there's some privacy and they'll probably be designed a way where they can easily take it away. Also, and I say this over and over and over again, use cash. Every single Bitcoiner should be using cash whenever possible. It is, you know, getting rid of cash is just not acceptable. It's an extremely dangerous thing. And, you know, recently I was in uh, Stockholm, Sweden, 
And of course, we no got one. some cash out and said, can I actually use this? And it was very hard. Very few places accepted yeah, it. That, that country is on the verge of fascism. All it takes is one government to get into power who wants to get more power. And they can undo all their progress in liberty and freedom. That's right. Yeah, Nordic countries in Europe, for those that wouldn't know, uh, don't use cash anymore. Germany is really fighting for cash. France is yeah. meh. And the South don't, don't really yeah. care. But, you know, more importantly, when I see Bitcoiners go pay with credit cards, I am not impressed. Because so often they would be very easy for them to just pay with cash. They're in countries where cash is still widely accepted, yet they don't. That, you know, there is not an excuse for this. Exactly. Especially like those same guys run a node, do yeah. mixing, yeah. and then yeah. just spend Paying with Paying with cash card. is more important than all the other stuff you went to cosplay doing. Yeah. Privacy is a human right. And the cypherpunk and yourself have been for fighting for it for so yeah. long now. Yep. Feel like an endless fight, and it, it will be endless. Well, it will be endless. Yeah, it will be endless. I mean, it's endless in the same way that the fight against crime is endless. We will never live in a society where people don't try to go steal stuff. And we will never live in a society where people don't try to gain more power. It's the same thing in both cases. Well, you know what, uh, what's left? Uh, Peter, thank you so much uh, for thank your you. time. Thank you also for um, all your efforts with Kuba Plus and yeah. uh, the lecture you gave to the kids. Uh, so yeah, to refer, we are, at, uh, we are in El Salvador for Kuba Plus. So it's a lightning program to help um, local engineers and computer science students get into uh, lightning and Bitcoin so they can get an uh, intern in Bitcoin companies and uh, start to build the future of El Salvador, uh, which uh, We'll see how it goes. Like you talked about politics, actually funny too. You talked so much about politics and responsibility of the people while we're here in the country where they had that chance to actually uh, use privacy tools and Bitcoin the right of way. Of course, El Salvador isn't perfect. I mean, I had to go show my ID to get a, a SIM card. I want to see that get fixed. You had to do that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. to get a SIM card, you got to go show ID here. I mean, this trip, you guys went and gave me one, but like, yeah, like yeah. last time when I got an actual oh, no, 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 yeah, at the yeah. airport. You yeah. go downtown and there's the dude selling, uh, giving you well, a SIM but, card. But legally, they're not supposed to do that. All right, yeah, like true. That, like if, you know, if I was in Ukraine, I'd just get a SIM card anywhere and I don't show ID. Yeah, it was the same in Chile. In Chile, yeah. you just ask for a SIM card, you yeah. don't show any ID, you go to the pharmacy, you put some cash, they give you credit on yeah. your SIM card and you have a phone number yeah. and it's perfect. This, this is a very good example of privacy. You should be able to have a phone number and a mobile, you know, mobile data without proving your ID. Yeah. There's actually an app, uh, it's called uh, OnOff, uh, that does that. Like it can simply let you have like phone numbers in any countries yeah. and it's like three bucks a month. Yeah. Uh, of it's course, your IMEI numbers, unfortunately, are fixed, which is yet another one of these things. I mean, unfortunately, we, we need a legislation solution here because in a lot of countries, it's legislation saying IMEI numbers must be fixed yeah. and must be unchangeable. And we need the opposite. We need to say that phone manufacturers have to shift with randomized IMEIs that can change. And again, the only way to ground this is politics because we're not going to be able to avoid this. You may have uh, turned a little bit of my mind. Even though I don't like politics, I may do a bit yeah. more. Well, Sometimes uh, you got to fight things at their level. Yeah, that's true. That's true. All right, guys. Uh, thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions for Peter, ask them in the description, even though he's probably never going to read them. But who knows? You never know. <laughs> we never know. He, he may argue with you because after talking so much with you uh, over all the conference, uh, I know you love arguing. Damn and, right. Uh, <laughs> it's probably what you do best. So maybe we'll argue with you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, don't forget to like, subscribe. I hope you like uh, this new YouTube channel for the Sovereign University. It's a 100% open source uh, e-learning platform on Bitcoin from beginners to lightning dev and RGB dev. Uh, all the courses are free and copyright free. Spread knowledge, use the tools, fight tyranny. You know, the, you, you got it. Thank, Thank you. Peter.